Well, we've been talking about the covenants that God has established, and of course we've laid a lot of groundwork, and we were talking about uh, the covenant that he made with Israel. And uh, when we last spoke about this, we talked about God bearing Israel up on wings as of an eagle. And so, Lord, I want to thank you tonight that you're going to open our minds and our hearts, that we might receive your word, and we might be able to apply it to where we are and what's going on in our lives and encourage ourselves in you like David did. And so, if we look at the book of 2 Samuel 6, 6 through 7, we see that... Uh, God here revealed his holy character. And uh, those who did not keep the covenant found that the same holiness broke out against them in destruction. All right. And David, as we recall the story, 2 Samuel 6, 6 through 7, David and the chosen men of Israel sought to bring the Ark of the Covenant from Amenadab's house in kiriath Jerem, where it had remained for almost a hundred years. And they went to get the Ark and brought it up upon an ox cart, which was against the law of God. God had decreed that the Ark would be carried on their shoulders, not on a cattle cart. And so when they sinned or they transgressed the law, it caused the holiness of God to break out uh, against Uzzah because he reached up and touched the ark, which he was also not supposed to do, to try and steady it. And you know, we all have a lot of reasons why we try to help God out. But if it's not what God has established, we're sinning. We're not helping God at all. We're putting ourselves in a place of judgment. And so... This transgression of the law caused the holiness of God to break out on Yuza. And, of course, it killed him. And God had revealed himself here and, and his nature when he gave them the Ten Commandments. In Deuteronomy 4, 23 and 24, the second commandment prohibits graven images. And Moses said, I... He said, take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of your Lord God, which he made with you, and make for yourselves a graven image in the form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous fire. And so there are many pictures in the Bible that show us the character and the nature of God. And we may, we just may not recognize them and the amount of uh, importance they have to our lives today. And so if we, if we look at it this way, it was the all-pervasive love of God that was the primary basis for his relationship and his covenant with the nation of Israel. Just like it was with Adam, just like it was with... Uh, Abraham, the love of God. But God will not and cannot overlook evil. But he's always merciful. So in the book of Exodus, he revealed himself as a merciful God when he put Moses in the cleft of the rock and asked, when Moses asked him to show me your glory, he wanted to see God. Now, God had said that no man could see him and live, could not look upon the glory and live. And so he put Moses in this crack in the rock, and as Moses passed, as the Lord passed by before Moses and proclaimed himself, he said, The Lord, the Lord, a merciful God, gracious, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness and truth, keeping mercy and loving kindness for thousands forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. 
Exodus 34, 6 and 7. So we see that God has a way of doing things. He reveals himself in his ways. And so there's a difference in knowing God. There is a, a, a scripture that says that the children of Israel knew the acts of God. Mm -hmm. They saw his miracles. They saw the things that he did, uh, turning, uh, making water come out of the rock and delivering them through the Red Sea and all of the things that they did. But Moses knew his ways. It means he knew him more personal. He knew his character. He knew uh, his ways. He knew how God acted and how God was thinking. And, of course, we know that, that God himself said that there had never been a man that he had ever dealt with face to face except Moses. So Moses was a, a great prophet before God, but Moses also knew God's ways. And so if we think about it, all of God's dealings with mankind have been based on the law. Yet this proclamation he made in Exodus 34 balances his revelation of himself in the Ten Commandments. He's gracious. He's slow to anger. And so we go back to that old adage, the old example I keep giving, is that if you put your finger in a 220 electrical socket, you're going to get electrocuted. It will stop your heart. But that doesn't make 220 electricity vengeful, hateful, mean-spirited, and out to get you. It means there is a way that you approach with respect electricity. Uh, Ron's an electrician. He would say, yes, we have to approach electricity with respect. We have to know its ways, don't we? We know how it not only acts, but we know its ways. And so it is the same with the holiness of God. When used improperly, electricity can kill you. Well, if you are dealing with God and the holiness of God, if you don't come according to the way God said to come, then it can kill you. Not because he wants it to kill you, but because it can't help but break forth on you, just like an electrical shock would. God is who he is. And he declared himself, I am who I am. And I am is all holiness. He is all purity. So when mankind, who's contaminated by the fall, as seen in the covenant with Adam, comes into contact with this kind of a God in an improper manner, it's like sticking their finger into a 220 light socket. He's not an attacker. He is a loving creator. Many want to accuse him of being an attacker, but he is not an attacker. He is trying to protect his creation. And the creation is so dense, they don't want to be protected. They think he's trying to keep them from something great. Well, I just dare you. Stick your finger in the light socket. See how it goes for you. Light is wonderful. Power is great. It does good things, heats our houses, fixes everything that we have. Uh, as far as that goes, it makes your machinery run. It's great, but if you treat it wrong, it's not going to be great any longer. There's a way to treat it. So there is an aspect of the creator, the loving creator that Israel had to learn and to begin to respect. Now, in this hour, respect seems to be very, in, in very little measure. Respect. Uh, it, people are not respectful. They don't respect um, their elders. They don't respect the law. I'm not talking about everybody, but I'm talking about as a culture, our nation has become very disrespectful. And yet they demand disrespect, but they are very disrespectful. And so... Learning to respect God and his creation uh, can be a, a challenge to our 
finite mind to, to recognize that. The way we learn the lessons sometimes is the hard way. Now, I always wanted my children to learn everything the easy way. So he would like to instruct them and try and keep them from making mistakes and help them so they don't make the same mistakes you did to learn and all of these things. And yet, when it comes down to it, they see you as being an interrupter in their wonderful ideas of life and what they're going to achieve. And so what do they do? They ignore you, and they do it their way, and they get hurt. Same as God. It's the same way, the same heart of God. Now, the covenant with Israel is it was initiated to protect mankind, to give man a way to approach God to restore fellowship that was lost from the Garden of Eden. And the understanding of this covenant will help us to understand the new covenant. The new covenant, the one that Jesus Christ initiated and completed. You see, mankind has always seen laws as things to hinder them. Have you ever met anybody that doesn't think the law applies to them? Yeah. I mean, seriously, there's a lot of people. They do not think that the stop sign means to stop for them. They don't think that they shouldn't go through the gas station to avoid the stop sign and jump out the other side to go the other direction. They don't think that applies to them. That's for everybody else. They just don't think the law applies for them. <laughs> ah, but laws are there to protect you. What if everybody cut through the... I well, didn't say I was talking about you, but if you want to apply it. <laughs> but, I mean, uh, we don't recognize laws are there to protect us. If we keep running red lights, we're going to get killed. If we don't watch where we're going, we're going to get hurt, and we're going to hurt someone else. It isn't that because we decided to go, all of creation stops. Oh! Nobody breathes till you've finished. No, it's not like that at all. Everything goes on. And sometimes it puts us in the wrong place. Well, same thing with God. His laws are there to protect us. But man being a rebel at heart, always saying these things don't apply to me. And the prisons are full of people that the law does not apply to. I would like to tell you that the law, because they're in the prison, it does apply to them. Obviously, it has full jurisdiction over their life, doesn't it? All right, so man in his fallen state sees the law as something to hinder him and keep him from having a good time and getting his way. And starting with this disobedience and a little of disobedience here and a little there, then man becomes blinded to what he's doing blinded to the truth, blinded to what he's supposed to be doing and ignoring everything else. Under the old covenant, obedience was the answer. And sacrifices were made because of disobedience and rebellion. The covenant with Israel was a covenant of law. How many have heard of that Moses was the lawgiver? He went up the mountain and... He came back with tablets of the law, didn't he? Now, unless Israel was obedient to God's commands, there was no way that they could receive what God had promised to them. Because it was a if you, then I will covenant. If you, then I will. But it was a covenant of law. Deuteronomy 6.25, And it will be accounted as righteousness, Conformity to God's will in word, thought, and action for us if we are watchful to do all this commandment before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. So keeping the law was accounted to Israel as righteousness of works, the righteousness of the law. Even today, Israel remi remains bound in the working of righteousness 
according to the law because they have not seen Jesus as the fulfillment of the law. Now, the ratification of this covenant that he made through Moses by giving the law is blood. After God gave the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 and the ordinances in chapters 21 and 23, Moses then took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has said we will do, and we will be obedient. Exodus 24, 7. Have you ever said that to God? I'll do anything you tell me to do. I will be obedient. I'll do anything that you tell me to do. Just tell me to do something. Well, the Bible is full of what you need to do. <laughs> right, all right. So it kind of gives us a place to go. But at that point, as he read this, he erected an altar at the foot of Mount Sinai and put 12 pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Oxen were offered up as burnt offerings and peace offerings upon this altar. And in Exodus 24, 8, Moses took the remaining half of the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So the sprinkling of the blood on the altar was the expression of the covenant relationship between God and the people of Israel. The ratification, the solemn establishment of the covenant as confirmed by Hebrews 9.18. Hebrews 9.18 says, So even the old first covenant, God's will, was not inaugurated and ratified and put in force without the shedding of blood. Without the shedding of blood. God made the blood as an important, very important thing uh, as far as his covenants went. And so that's very important to us. If we understand the importance of the blood, then we will begin to respect and honor the blood of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9.22 says, In fact, under the law, almost everything is purified by means of blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is neither release from sin and its guilt, nor the remission of the due and merited punishment for sin. So if there is no blood, then there is no forgiveness and there is no protection from judgment and punishment. It takes the blood. The sprinkling of blood signified both purification and forgiveness. And these are all types that are to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. God established his covenant with Israel with the sacrifice of animals and with the sprinkling of their blood. God confirmed with his people this covenant. He was deeply involved with it. All of the covenants that God has, that we have studied here, that the God has made, he has been totally involved with. That is how interested he is in mankind. He's just not gone somewhere and left everybody to their own devices. But he's very interested. He is setting a groundwork here to deliver them from the wages of sin and death. Sprinkling the blood of sacrifice on the altar and the people brought them into a relationship with God. And then in the book of Leviticus, we see him setting up a sacrificial system culminating in the Day of Atonement. So for the Israelites who said, yes, yes, everything you say we're going to do, this looked contradictory. What do we need all this blood for? They asked. We're going to be faithful, and we mean every word we say. But they didn't understand how soon they would turn away from the Ten Commandments and how much they would need purification and forgiveness. The heart of the need of Israel was for salvation. Israel's problem was not what she was speaking out of her mouth, in this instance, she's going to do everything that God said to do. Everything down to the least little thing. And yet, 
we see that that didn't work because Israel had heart trouble. Her heart was not towards God. You can't be obedient when your heart is not obedient. You, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, when you're just a little rebel inside, uh, it's, you're not going to be obedient. You're going to be rebellious. And without Jesus Christ, mankind has no other choice. Having fallen from a, a, a relationship with God from the Garden of Eden that uh, was established, that, that relationship was established, but he fell from it because of disobedience, hard-heartedness, heart trouble. Now, the fulfillment of this covenant was on God's side. He would never have this covenant of the law be broken. Now, we know that Israel was not able to keep it, but God was faithful to his covenant because it was his covenant. Remember we said divine covenants are only initiated by God himself. Even if Israel would prove faithless and disobedient and be sent back into captivity as punishment, because of this covenant, he would never forsake her totally, no matter what she did. Now, I don't know about you, but that is faithfulness of God. He does not leave us. Israel was a whore. She went after every other god that came up within her vision. And in Leviticus 26, 44 through 45, God said, and yet for all that, and yet for all that, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not spurn and cast them away. Neither will I despise or abhor them to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them. For I am the Lord their God. But I will for their sake earnestly remember the covenant with their forefathers whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations that I might be their God. I am the Lord. It wasn't that God did not show himself mighty. It was that Israel didn't have a heart for God. She just didn't have a heart. Now, in Deuteronomy 5, 28 and 29, following Moses reciting the Ten Commandments and the people's vow of obedience, God himself said, I have heard the words of this people which they have spoken to you, and they have said well all that they have spoken. Oh, that they had such a mind and a heart in them always reverently to fear me and to keep all my commandments, at, that it might go well with them and their children forever. You see, if God had been totally loved, then it would have been no problem to keep the commandments. It's a love issue. But their hearts were not right or sincere with him. Neither were they faithful, Psalm 78, 37, and steadfast to his covenant. That's why Israel could not walk in agreement with the word of God. Regardless of Israel's failure to keep God's covenant, they couldn't annul the covenant or do away with it. It was God's covenant, not Israel's. Israel violated the conditions of the covenant, but the covenant remained the same. The problem was the heart of man and God himself would be providing a way to change the heart of man. In the meantime, all they had was animal sacrifices and the shedding of blood that only covered sin. But they could not take away sin as God would when he brought the substance of this in Jesus Christ. So since Israel as a nation finally proved disobedient, God moved out beyond the natural to the spiritual Israel. The sea, in the seed of Abraham, all the nations of the world would surely be blessed. His was his plan from the beginning, knowing what was going to happen to bring the Gentiles, the nations, the Gentiles, into this relationship. And it's very important for us to realize that the keeping of the law was legalistic works. 
and man could not keep legalistic works. I mean, you can look at your own lives and you know if you make a New Year's resolution by the 5th of January, it's done. You have broken it. You may have resolved. You may have decided. You were in all of these things. You just knew you were going to make it, but you did not make it. All your legalism and your works could not change your nature. It takes God to change our nature. Okay, the next um, covenant that we'll talk about, besides this one, is the fifth divine covenant, which is the covenant that God made with David. And uh, let's go to 2 Samuel 7, 12, 13, and 16. God spoke to David through Nathan the prophet. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Now that's a pretty big statement from God, isn't it? Because forever is how long? That's a very long time, isn't it? We don't even have a concept of forever. Although we use the word, I love you forever, and all of these forever statements. And yet, we don't know what forever means because it's forever. Uh, there's no end to it. And so he's stating here that this covenant that he's making with David is going to set up David's kingdom forever. And David is a mere mortal man. He is not going to last forever. Right? He's going to die. So this covenant was made between God and David soon after David became king over Israel. Many generations later, God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 33, 21. He spoke to Jeremiah of this covenant, and he addressed it as my covenant with David, my servant. It was his covenant. Now, the covenant of God with Israel to be his continuing people extends into David's kingship because we see this covenant with the promise of an everlasting kingship. All the covenants taken together, starting from Adam, in fact, starting from creation, which we talked about creation being the overarching covenant that these all other minor, more minor covenants dwell within. They all move together towards a certain end. Jesus Christ was the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. The plan was in place before anything was ever created. And if the plan was in place and Jesus was the lamb slain, did God know the beginning from the end? Yep. He said he is the alpha, the beginning. That's the Greek alpha is the Greek letter for beginning and the omega is the last letter of the grief out he is the beginning and he is the end many times we dwell on the fact that jesus is the beginning but we don't recognize with all our fears and all our work and all our trepidations he's still the end if he's still the end he has it in control he has it and so we see that the plan was in place God knew what man was when he created the world. It was not a surprise to him. He didn't have to have a meeting, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make a new plan. He didn't have to do that. No, 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 no counsel, no, it didn't have to happen. Psalm 89, 4, in David's line, God would establish a perpetual throne or a kingdom. And Jeremiah 33, 17, for thus says the Lord, David shall never fail to have a man, a descendant, to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. And in Psalm 89, 3 and 4, you have said, I've made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant, your seed I will establish forever. And I will build up your throne for all generations. Selah, which means pause and think calmly about that. 
Well, that is so vast, it's hard to be calm and think about it. Now, this was the promise that God made to David. Uh, there are some that are still believing that David's throne is still an eternal throne and that it is being, uh, what will we say, fulfilled in the British monarchy. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, twist of things. And, but we recognize, and we will recognize when we finish this, that that is not quite what God is saying. The ratification of David's covenant is by God himself. In Psalm 89, 34, 35, he says, My covenant will not break or profane, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Once and for all I have sworn by my holiness, which cannot be violated, and I will not lie to David. So he swore to David by himself, by his holiness, and by his oath. I would think that's, you could trust that. What do you think? I think that uh, we've got the holiness, we've got the man the, himself, God, and the oath. And then in Psalm 132, 11 are these words. The Lord swore to David in truth, he will not turn back from it. One of the fruit of your body I will set upon your throne. Now there is no higher ratification than God himself swearing by himself because there was nobody greater to swear by. He swore by himself, he gave his word, and he said that all I am backs this up, being that he, one of his names was the great I am. So the covenant obligation was only for God. He didn't ask anything from David by way of response. There was no if you, then I will. It was just, I'm gonna do this thing. Ooh, that reminds me of something. I'm going to do this thing. Okay, the covenant is firm, regardless of any possible default by David's son. Now Solomon, we know he didn't do everything right, did he? He fell away. He worshipped profane gods. 2 Samuel 7, 14 and 15, God said, I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the sons of men. But my mercy and loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took them from Saul, whom I took away from before you. So God took the kingdom from Saul, who was a king after the flesh, and he gave the kingdom to David, David was a king given to Israel according to the spiritual realm, according to the Holy Spirit. So what we see in the dealings with God, with David, there are more spiritual. The things we see with Saul and his descendants are of the flesh. You can see the separation as you read 1 and 2 Samuel and some of the Chronicles. You see that separation, the flesh versus the spirit, the battle that is there. And this kingship would endure no matter how evil David's later descendants might be. Interesting. Psalm 89, 32, 34. If his children, speaking of David, if his children forsake my law and walk not in my ordinances, if they break or profane my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I punish their transgressions with a rod of chastisement and their iniquity with stripes. Everybody's getting a whipping. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not break off from him, nor allow my faithfulness to fail, to lie and to be false to him. My covenant will not break or profane or alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. So David's kingship will endure forever regardless of what man will do. The fulfillment of the Davidic covenant is in the birth of Jesus Christ. Jesus is born of the line of Judah. Dave, David.
from the tribe of Judah. So the sons of David, the Old Testament records show, did turn from God's ways. They went the other way, and the line of the kings did come to an end. But the last king that reigned on the throne of David was King Zedekiah in 597 to 587 B.C., and then for six centuries, there was no descendant of David on the throne. The genealogy in Matthew shows that the lineage went on even though they lost the ability to sit on the throne of David because of disobedience. When I do the seed of the woman, we go through all of that from Adam, tracing the seed of uh, Jesus Christ, and we see all the ways that God sidestepped the devil trying to kill and interfere in this to stop it from happening. But God always, of course, could outsmart the devil. You have to remember that. God is not uh, worried about the devil. Uh, he knows exactly what needs to happen. And so the one to come would do something no son of David had ever done. He would establish and uphold the throne of David from then on eternally because he would reign forever. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of David, the Son of Man. There was no need for any kings after Jesus Christ because he was the king of all kings. Amen. There was no king like him. There would never be another king like him because he would always be the king. The one to reign on the throne of David will be God himself. What a pathetic thing that mankind would think that he could trace this lineage all the way through this line and that line and it's going to come over here and it's going to be there. I want to tell you something. God gave Jesus and he came through that lineage and he is the answer to this eternal kingship, the promise of the covenant that God made himself with David. Right. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. For unto us a child is born. For unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father of Eternity. Prince of Peace. Don't you just love those names? They'll speak of Jesus. Of the increase of his government and of peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from the latter time forth, even forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. God's covenant, God will perform his covenant. Every word that's gone out of his mouth, he will keep. If he has given you a word, then he will keep that word. Amen. You may, you may fail, but God will never fail. Amen. And he is not a man that he should lie. Now that does not mean that we don't respect him and that we should go on acting like heathen idiots. What it means is we need to respect God and to recognize that we gain so much more from being in covenant with him than being out on our own, doing our own thing, thinking that the law doesn't apply to us. It is a covenant of love. It's a covenant of mercy. And it speaks of Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. He will rule and reign forever. He will rule and reign forever. Now there is a man seated in heaven. A man, very God and very man. Never, never would even the angels have dared to think that would ever happen. But God had a plan. And through that man who is the mediator and the great intercessor for us, we can come boldly before the throne of grace, knowing that we have mercy in time of trouble because of the blood 
of Jesus that was shed on the cross at Calvary that we might receive forgiveness of sin. Not covering, but forgiveness. Total forgiveness. It never existed as far as God is concerned because the blood of Jesus paid the price for man's disobedience. I hope this encourages you. I hope it's, I, I know that it's a lot of information, but the whole point and picture is to unto us a child is born. As we come up towards the Christmas season, I mean, Jesus was born to die. That's why he came. I think we overrate Christmas and we don't rate Easter and the Good Friday for us. Uh, we don't rate those high enough because he was born to complete these covenants there for us that we would have an open and everlasting way into the throne of grace. That God would be in relationship with us once again. We would have access to him like Adam had access to him in the Garden of Eden. That we would be seen through the blood of Jesus Christ. Our sins all forgiven. Changing us. Do you realize that this changes your very nature? You can't abide and be your old same self. You can't. If you receive Christ, you can't. This works in your life and it changes you. And you may squirm and you may cry, but I want to tell you what, it's so good for you. Amen. Because he is a loving, merciful father. And he will deliver you from all that would harm you and bring you out into a place of his marvelous light. Praise God. Let's just pray together tonight. Lord, we just repeat after me. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. And we rededicate our hearts and our minds to you tonight. And we will say like the children of Israel, everything you said, we will do. And we can do it because Jesus came and changed our hearts when he shed his precious blood on the cross at Calvary. Lord, we thank you for forgiving our sins, for changing our hearts, from delivering us from the kingdom of darkness, and bringing us into your marvelous light. You will teach us and we will learn. And we will learn. You will lead us. You will lead us. And we will follow. And we will follow. And we thank you for that tonight, Lord. Thank you for that tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Everything I said, I'm going to do with God's help. Amen. Amen. Join us for services at Wellspring Church of All Nations, a dynamic church that lifts up the name of Jesus. We are meeting at 4870 Janelle Drive, located between Buffalo and Durango, with an entrance at 8140 West Lone Mountain Road. Our focus is to win the lost, connect them to Jesus and His church, train them in the Word of God, and help them find their place in the work of the Lord. Our service times are 10.45 a.m. and 6 p.m. on Sunday and 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-631-5027. That's 631-5027. Or you can visit our website, www.wellspringministries.com.